Everybody remember what we talked about last week? Yep, sacrament of reconciliation. So this week we're talking about the other sacrament of healing. Anointing of the sick. Excellent, May. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Okay, so this is Lesson 11, page 95. Page 95. So today, I said we're going to talk about anointing of the sick and how does God help us when it hurts. So we're going to start by praying and meditating on a few scripture passages. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavily bird laden, and I will give you rest. Let your hearts be troubled, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. And they cast out many demons, and anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. I have said this to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we're also going to talk about redemptive suffering. You, have you heard that term before? What redemptive suffering means? Okay, so we'll get into what redemptive suffering means versus regular suffering. Okay, the story on page 96. We're going to dive in here. The woman who wanted to say goodbye. Come fast. She is at the end. Father G Jim Crisman, a priest of the Archdiocese of Denver, put on his collar and rushed to the hospital. There in the ICU lay a 60-year-old woman on a respirator with her sisters at her side. She had been brain dead for 10 days. All that remained was to give her the anointing of the sick and allow her family to say their goodbyes. The end of her journey on earth had arrived. As he had done many times, Father Jim took out his oils for the anointing and opened his prayer book. He read the prayers, anointing her head and hands. Through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. As he finished tracing the sign of the cross on her head, her eyes opened. She tried to set up rip the tubes out, and talk. He had been prepared for this kind of thing in the seminary, and he knew what to do. He turned to the woman's sisters and explained that the primary effect of this sacrament is spiritual healing and the grace to face death, but that sometimes a temporal physical healing is needed to make that possible. This woman he gently suggested, might need to give or receive forgiveness from someone before she died. He asked, do you know who that might be? Eyes wide, they slowly nodded. She needs to be reconciled with her daughter. Then get her here right now, he said. The daughter was already on her way to the hospital. She walked into the room expecting to find her mother unconscious or dead. She was amazed to find her mother sitting there, waiting for her. They reconciled with one another in tears and with great joy. Then the mother said goodbye, 
lay back down on the hospital bed and died. This is the power we find in anointing of the sick, a sacrament where Jesus himself comes to us to strengthen us, comfort us, and give us healing. We need the healing we need, whether that healing be physical or spiritual. So this, this story, kind of, this is what we're talking about today, the anointing of the sick, this sacrament. Now, the case we read here is probably a more dramatic case of receiving this sacrament. This woman who'd been unconscious, basically brain dead for 10 days, suddenly set up. alert you know but then upon reconciling with her daughter that was what she needed to do the last bit of business she needed here in the physical world god gave her the healing she needed to take care of that last bit of business before she died like i said this is a more dramatic case <clears throat> where we see a physical effect from the sacrament. But that doesn't mean that every time we see this, receive this sacrament, it's not, could not be as dramatic internally or as healing internally or spiritually. So let's watch our uh, first video here. So we'll do our questions real quick, and then we'll do some discussion on this. Suffering is part of God's creation from the beginning. Was, was suffering part of God's plan from the beginning of creation? How many say no? Okay. Anyone say yes? Okay, that's correct. It was not part of the original plan. So when did suffering... Why do we have suffering? What precipitated suffering in the world? Because of original sin, the fall. That had consequences and still does. <clears throat> this name means God is with us, even in our suffering. Emmanuel. Right, you're both right. Emmanuel. So, so have you ever known anyone that's experienced great suffering? Have you? Have you experienced great suffering? Never? Well, I'll tell you about a, a friend of mine. She's, she befriended my wife and I when we first moved here years ago. 24 years ago. And befriended us and, and, and we're still very close to us. We, we kind of consider her like one of, she's kind of like an adopted grandmother to us. Because all of our family lives in Illinois. But she's here. And she's been a great spiritual mentor for me over the years. Watching her and her faith has helped me grow in faith. But in the last several years... Her health has declined considerably. She's homebound, almost virtually bedridden, in a great deal of pain. And she's in one of those situations where the medication for the pain upsets some of her other conditions. And it's a vicious cycle. Okay. So she has a lot of suffering in her life. If she takes the medication to ease the pain... It, it flares up her intestinal issues, which causes a different kind of pain. And there's not much that can be done medically for her other than to try to balance those. She also was a heavy smoker for, well, she still is a smoker, 
for many, many, many years. So now she also suffers from COPD. So she should have oxygen, but she doesn't like the oxygen. <laughs> and so she suffers with that. And, you know, over the last several years, we've watched her dwindle down physically. She's now a very small, almost like a skeletal person. She's lost all that. And you would think all that suffering, all that, you know, I'm ready to leave this world even that she goes through because in this, in these years, she's also lost two of her sons. They've died. She's lost two grandchildren and she couldn't even, except for one of the sons, she couldn't even go to the funerals because she wasn't physically able to. So, you know, you, you can see that kind of suffering and you would think she would be in despair and want it to be over. But every time we see her, she tells us, yes, I'm in a lot of pain. Yes, I'm suffering. A lot of days I wake up and say, Lord, why'd you give me another one? But then she says, I can't be angry with God because I know he has a reason for me to still be here and suffering. There is something that he is doing through this suffering. That there is a purpose for it. Her faith has actually grown stronger in this suffering. God is working through that. And like I said, she still continues to be a spiritual mentor to me that in that suffering, she's not angry with God. She knows God is working through it. And maybe one of those works is actually helping me. Or maybe it's helping her children. And we won't know, she won't know till she meets God and God reveals his full plan to her. Okay. And we also, in the video, it also talked about what two gifts did God give us? Free will and his love, right? Now, the other gift we'll talk about some other time is, is, is we also have intellect, which makes us different. But his love, because he is love, pure love, and he gave us free will. But because of free will, he has to allow suffering once it entered the world, right? Because he can't, if he took it away, take it away, you have to take away the consequences of our decisions. And our decisions always have consequences, good or bad. And have you ever experienced where suffering brings out something good? Have you seen that? Well, the, the, the more life experience you get, you will see the, that suffering sometimes brings out a good reaction. Um, I'll give you another personal story. You, you guys are probably learning way too much about me. But this one was when I was in a sophomore in college. I'd been home over Labor Day weekend, went with my cousin riding four-wheelers, my brother and her brother, my other cousin. They were on dirt bikes. And we were riding along the trails along the river. And I am not an experienced in riding motorcycles or four wheelers. That's, I never had one. It would actually belong to my cousin. It was hers. But she let me drive it on the way out. She didn't trust me to drive it on the trails in the woods, but she thought I could drive it on the road out. And coming out from where we were, I don't know if you were, there was a levee. And we were between the river and the levee. And if you don't know what a levee is, it's a big mound of dirt that runs along the river to try to keep the floodwaters from the river getting into the fields, similar to what broke there in the story for Katrina. 
So we had to drive up the levee. So I you know, followed the road, drove up the levee, doing fine, until I realized there were cars parked at the top of the levee. Well, the levee's very narrow. I drove around the cars, but that put us at a pretty steep angle and I got nervous. So I drove down and couldn't see because the weeds were taller than we were. I thought, I'll just drive back around and go back up and try it again. Not thinking about one of the things you have with a levee is a floodgate pit. I drove us off into a 10-foot concrete pit. I hit the pit wall with my face. Luckily, it did not knock me out. No, I was not wearing a helmet. So it severely cut my face. I had about, I think it was 30 some stitches to repair my face. Well, I was also in college, so that happened on Sunday, Monday evening, I went back to college. Tuesday morning, I was walking across campus. Can you imagine how I looked? I was stitched here, stitched here, and you know, if I didn't have this mask on, you could probably see those scars. You could probably imagine what I looked like two days after this happened. I'm walking across campus. There's a girl walking, oh, you know, maybe 10, 15 feet in front of me. And we're walking across this field because the dorm I lived in, they, they put the, uh, the freshman and I stayed, it was still in the freshman dorm. We were at the outskirts of campus. We had to walk in. And, and I don't think the girls overheard, knew I could overhear them. One of her friends was coming the opposite way. And before she got to her, I heard her make a comment to the other girl. Oh my God, that's awful. Of course, the girl in front of me, well, my outfit's not that bad. <laughs> she thought the girl was talking to her about her outfit. Well, how do you think that made me feel? Well, I knew what I looked like. Okay. And actually, that was one of the moments that God really worked a grace in my life and used my suffering from that for good. Because for a very long time, I'd had a very negative outlook on life. I was a very negative person, probably some form of depression, mild depression. And I finally realized if I can walk across campus looking like that, I can do just about anything else. That really I can see in my life where I started having a different attitude about myself and a different outlook on life. All from the suffering of smacking my face against a concrete wall. Don't recommend it though. Not, not, not a great experience, but that, that, is, that is a time where suffering, God used that suffering for good. That was a definite turning point in my life. One of those moments in my life I can look back and say, I know God was there. God was working in my life, even though at that time I wasn't real close to him. So let's watch our next segment. Okay, so what did Father Gillick show that when we're hurting, we need to do what? Put ourselves where we can be found. Easy to say, sometimes hard to do. When we allow our suffering to be joined with Christ, we can experience our suffering being redeemed very good so how do what are some ways we can allow god into our suffering how do you allow god into your suffering by call to god and let him 
Okay, calling, just asking him. Calling. What did I hear from this side of the room? Did I hear something? I thought I heard the answer. So what's some other ways? Just simply asking God. Pray. That was the answer I thought I heard over here. Pray. Hey, okay, praying. By going to church, spending some time in front of the tabernacle, the blessed sacrament. Going to Mass. Or like I said, just going in and praying. Or sitting quietly. Sometimes apparently sitting in the middle of the street. I know as I've gotten older that this still struggle with this, how do I turn my suffering over to God? That's still kind of a, a how do I do that? But I have found that prayer helps me. I don't pray for God to take the situation away anymore. I just pray to God, God, I have this going on in my life. I pray for your help. And sometimes the answer is not immediate, but I have generally found the answer is there. It may take time, but after a little while I realize God helped me get through that situation. May not have taken the situation completely away, may not have resolved it the way I would have chosen, but by just praying to God for his help, in this situation, I need guidance, I need help, I don't know what to do, help with this, that eventually we work through it. He helps me work through it. Why do you think we have these in our churches, in our homes? Because, do you know, have you, for many of the other Protestant religions, do they have a crucifix? No, they, they'll just have a plain cross, right, usually? You'll see that in, if you go in, they'll have a plain cross, but they won't have a crucifix. Now, we've sterilized a lot of these to, to some degree, like even this one. I mean, you don't see all the markings that he would have had from the scourging and everything. But it's to remind us that he suffered and died for us so that we know he knows what that is. He has had, Christ has had that experience as a human. In fact, he's had that experience to a degree that I hope none of us ever have to experience. So that means he understands suffering from a human level, not just as God, as a human, so that we can better come to him when we're suffering and let him into our suffering, and allow our suffering to do good in the world. Do you know any stories of saints who have suffered? Have you started looking or thinking about who your saint will be when you get confirmed next year? Well, I'm not asking you to say the saint, you know, for that, but can you think of a saint that suffered? A lot of them. How about, so you ever heard of St. Stephen? St. Stephen's the first martyr. In the Acts of the Apostles, it talks about him being stoned to death. Well, that would have hurt. How did most of the apostles die? 
They were killed. There's some suffering in that. <laughs> yeah, only one of them died a natural death, and even he was in exile, living in a cave on the island of Patmos in Greece. Have you ever heard of St. Lawrence? the patron saint of comedians. Lawrence was barbecued. He was barbecued. The story goes he was put on a grate over a fire. And at one point he told, the, the, the story goes, this is a myth, okay. but story goes that he said, I'm done on that side, flip me over. Hence why he's the patron saint of comedians. Another saint, head chopped off, carried his head back to his church, preaching the whole way. That's the story. That's the myth. So, suffering. We will talk about, uh, actually, the, one, one of the saints, the saint of the day yesterday, we, we'll, we'll talk about one of her compatriots here in a few minutes both of them were at a leper colony in Hawaii and uh, you will find most of your saint the most of the saints suffered in some way Okay, anointing of the sick confers a special grace on those who receive it, especially those in danger of death due to serious illness. And a person can receive this sacrament more than once. True. True. And the biblical roots of the anointing of the sick come from the book of James. So have, you, have any of you ever received anointing of the sick? Or know anyone that has? Every once in a while, we, there'll be a mass. Father will do a mass. Or Father Tim, a couple of times, did a mass for the anointing of the sick, for those that were suffering, you know, long-term or difficult illnesses. So if could come to that mass, and uh, receive it. And I know I, I've been to one of those masses and I have received it there. And growing up, like I said, it, when, I, when I was little, it was, it was, I learned it as last rites. <laughs> Thankfully, that has changed since then. But the crucifix in my bedroom was a home anointing of the sick kit the crucifix would slide off the base and stand up and then there were candles holy oil for or holy oil place for holy water and some other things in there so that you had the setup for when the pre if the priest needed to come to your home to anoint someone you had this uh kit ready luckily we never used it for that in my house but that, that was kind of, I always found that, that crucifix interesting because it slid apart and there was stuff inside it. And... So, when would you call a priest for anointing of the sick or go to a priest for anointing of the sick? Can you think of a time you would go or call? Right? Yeah, somebody's dying or really sick. You think of some other times? Yeah. 
How about somebody's just going in for a surgery? Or if you're facing a surgery. And I have seen Father anoint people. I haven't seen him actually perform the anointing, but I've seen people go into Father after Mass if they knew they were having surgery the next week to be anointed. Or if they're suffering a long-term illness or long-term physical condition. How about if you're struggling with a sin repeatedly? You can't get rid of this sin. Would you think to do anointing of the, ask for anointing of the sick in that case? Well, you can. Okay. Or what if you're you know, suffering from a period of like spiritual darkness or you know, struggling in your spiritual life. Yeah, that's, that's another time you could ask for anointing of the sick. You know, you're, because it's not just to heal, you know, we're not asking for physical healing and relief of physical suffering, also spiritual. And besides providing some physical help, you know, we're asking God for physical healing, what can the anointing of the sick also do for us? What else, what other gift can it give us? What? Eh, not what I'm looking for. How about hope? Can it give you some hope? Because Father Troop talked about his uncle, right? Facing cancer. Gave him hope. So anointing of the sick can also give you hope. Now, in here, and let me see if it's going to talk about it. Maybe that's what we're going to talk about next. Let me check. So, who administers the sacrament of anointing of the sick? The priest. Can anyone else administer this sacrament? How many think someone else could, in extraordinary circumstances, administer this sacrament? How many think... Okay, I got a couple. How many think that, no, it's, it is only the priest that can administer this sacrament? That's true. It is only a priest or a bishop, because a bishop is a priest. Okay. So a bishop or priest. What, why is that? Why is this reserved only for a bishop or priest to do? What is part of the... ceremony the rite he talked about it in there first of all what what did, what did he the, the priest in the video what did he put on before he started the purple stole when else does he wear that purple stole confession okay part of the rite of anointing of the sick can include confession. Confession can only be done administered by a priest. Okay. Part of, so all of that reference, that's why a priest is the only one that could administer this sacrament. Doesn't mean that if there's not a priest available that you can't pray for the sick person and that have effect, but you cannot administer the actual rite of anointing of the sick. And also, what's used in it? What did he use? Oil. Oil of the sick. 
Do you know what that oil is, actually? It is, it is holy oil because it has been blessed. But you know what kind of oil it is? Olive oil. Exactly, it is. It is olive oil. Have you seen, noticed, behind Father? The little cabinet that has little bottles in it? You never know. Do you know what those are? Those are the holy oils. One of which is for anointing of the sick. Two of which are used to bab the other two are used to baptism. One of them, one of those, is used for your confirmation. Okay. Each year during Holy Week, traditionally on Holy Thursday, but practically usually uh, a, sometime a day before that. Yeah, generally it's a Tuesday, but traditionally it is a thir it is Holy Thursday when they're when the bishops would bless that oil to be used for the next year, but practically so that all the priests can come and collect the oil for their parish, it's it's traditionally or more, most often done on a Tuesday anymore. But the bishop blesses that oil to be used for the year. So, why does God enter into the messy parts of our life? Help us. Mm -hmm. To help us. Because our lives are messy a lot of the times, right? And, and what was the exact... He talked in there in the, I believe it was the first video, about God entering the messiness of our lives... And how did he show that? How did Christ show us that from the very beginning? By being by being born where? In a cave. And not just a cave. What was the cave used for? Is that where the sheep were kept? Okay, what do you think a sheep cave was like? <laughs> and do you think they had time to really clean it out really, really well? And even if they cleaned it really, really well, it's been used by sheep for generation. <laughs> What's that cave going to be like? <laughs> kind of dirty, kind of smelly, kind of messy. That's where... God chose to be born in the messiness of our lives, in the messiness of the world. Also as sheep, because it was particularly a sheep cave, because what was the traditional animal of sacrifice? The lamb, sheep, goat. You see how God doesn't do anything without a plan? <laughs> it all, all the little pieces connect. There is a reason some of the, you know, and the reason we have these stories still. And does God promise to take the messiness out of our lives, that we'll never have messiness again if we turn to Him? No, because God knows, first of all, God knows one thing about us. We still have... What do we still have? What, what were the gifts He gave us from the beginning? Free will. Free will. We still have free will. So we're still going to make choices, and choices have consequences, some of which are good, some of which are bad. Okay. So God doesn't take those away from us because he's not going to take free will from us. And why won't he take free will from us? Why did he give us free will? So 
What? The, yeah, yeah, I see. Those, those are good reasons. That, but that's not the main reason. Yeah, that's not. God is. What, what, what do we associate God with? What theological virtue? God is love, right? And in order to love, you have to have free choice. You have to have free will. You can't force love. God can't force love on us because that wouldn't be love. So that's why messiness exists still, why sin still exists. Because once it entered the world, because of free will, he can't just take it out of our lives because we won't have free will. That's why he put his salvation plan in place to come be part of us, to suffer with us, to show us the way to make those choices. So that we can eventually choose love, choose to be with him, and eventually reside back in the garden, back in heaven, with him for eternity in his love. Father Damien of Malachi. So we're going to talk about another saint. And a saint who experienced suffering. And yesterday I told you that the saint of the day was a contemporary of, of St. Damien's here, of Father Damien. And that's St. Marianne Cope, also of Malachi. And, and she's mentioned in here in his story. But he, he's our hero of the week. Getting assigned to Hawaii for work sounds like a great adventure in paradise, doesn't it? Would you still be enthusiastic if you found out it was to live in a leper colony? In the 1870s, when Hawaii was still a kingdom, a health crisis hits the islands Hundreds of people were infected with various, this very contagious disease, or various, very, various contagious diseases. Leprosy hit hard, and King Kamhamaha ordered those who had this contagious disease to be sent to a colony on the island of Molokai in order to prevent the illness from spreading further. Father Damien, a Belgian priest, had been serving in Oahu as a missionary for many years. When he heard the inhabitants of the colony were in des desperate need of spiritual support, he volunteered to go. Father Damien not only provided the sacraments for those on this isolated community, he dressed wounds, painted houses, built homes. He also made coffins and dug graves for proper burials. In a letter to his brother, Father Damien expressed the whole of his mission in the secluded colony of Kalawahu. I make myself a leper for the lepers to gain all to Jesus. It became an opportunity for redemptive suffering. Offered simply, and in accordance with Christ's call to take up our crosses and follow his examples. He chose to stay with the community, although the original plan was to cycle through four priests in order to limit their exposure and provide periods of respite. Father Damien embraced the work he had before him to make the colony more than just habitable. It was home. He had plans to enlarge the orphanage, build a new, com new community buildings, and continue to add construction projects. 
Eventually, he contracted leprosy and redoubled his efforts to complete as many of his projects as possible. By this, the story of his courageous holiness had begun to spread around the world, and he was joined by four unlikely heroes, another Belgian priest, Father Louis Lombard Conradi, Mother Marion Cope, who ran a hospital in New York City, and she's, recently, she's the one that's recently be declared a saint. Her, Joseph Dutton, a Civil War soldier, and James Sennett, a nurse from Chicago. It took these four people to take over the task of Father Damien had been doing by himself. Wow. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the graces of God, what Father Damien himself could accomplish. When Father Damien died, he was laid to rest under the same tree where he napped. Upon his arrival, where he napped upon his arrival, this gentle and sweet closure to a life dedicated to the ailing people on Malachi demonstrates what we can that we can achieve great grace, Christ-like love, and heroism in the midst of pain and suffering, perhaps even because of it. St. Damien, pray for us. Help us to discover Christ's presence in our brokenness and pain. So yeah, look at what Father Damien did when he chose to embrace the suffering around him, and his own eventual suffering. That it took four people to really take over the work that he had been doing himself. And he knew the risk. Leprosy is a very contagious disease. He knew by staying that he would eventually, most likely, contract it. And when he did, he continued working as long as he could, trying to make the lives better for those in the colony, for those suffering. Okay, let's go to the wrap-up and just make sure we've covered these, these couple of words and, and then we'll come back to that one. Okay. One of the most mind-boggling mysteries of the Christian faith, if God is all-loving and all-powerful, why does suffering exist, right? Okay. As we've talked, this goes back to the Garden of Eden and our first parents bringing the consequences of evil into the world, and that evil's very real. And that brought sickness and death. And And here's a quote from Thomas Aquinas. And this is, this is what the good news really, that God permits evil in order to draw forth some greater good. So part of the good news is that even in the evil, God can use it to draw greater good. Love conquers evil. Okay, he, he allows the evil in the world. Not because he wants us to suffer but because of free will and the consequences of free will and choices. But that his love, his power can bring good from evil. He can take a situation of suffering and bring goodness into it and out of it. So the anointing of sick, that's one of the two healing sacraments. Okay, we talked about it goes, it can be given to the seriously ill, those in danger of death or already dying. But it's not just, and, and 
it, it's more for the spiritual healing, but it can have physical healing to it. Just as our example earlier today, the we read about the lady that sat up because she still needed to reconcile with her daughter before she died. She was granted some physical healing. Now, as part of this, sacrament can be viaticum. It's another term, viaticum. You might hear sometimes. And that is, because your father mentioned in here, that as part of the anointing rite, you, the recipient can receive the sacrament of reconciliation and also the sacrament of the Eucharist. Especially if they are close to death, that's viaticum. Food for the journey. They are anointed, receive the anointing of the sick, confess their last sins so they're in a state of grace. They receive Christ in the Eucharist as food for their journey. Viaticum. Um, I'll talk a moment about that here with my grandfather. He had been suffering from dementia for a number of years. My grandmother, a few years before he died, had to make the decision to put him in a nursing home. Okay. And when we get to the, all the theology of the body, I'll talk more about that, probably. That's where I usually talk about that. But anyway, a few years ago, right before Christmas, and I happened I happen to be in Illinois. That was one of the graces I consider of this event. I happened to be in Illinois because I had already went up for Christmas. But my grandmother had called my dad and said that Grandpa had pneumonia and it didn't look good. She had made the decision she was not transferring him to the hospital again to be put on super antibiotics to try to get rid of the pneumonia. That she was just going to let the pneumonia turn it to God, let the pneumonia run its course. Okay. So he was going to remain at the nursing home they did put him in a private room, and we're going to make him comfortable. But we knew it wouldn't be long. The next morning, she called and said, you better come. Okay. So I went with my dad, and my grandmother and aunt were already there. And there were two things troubling my grandmother that morning. And it wasn't so much that his time was up. It was they were having difficulties with the pharmacy getting pain meds to ease his suffering. And trying to, and the nurses were doing everything in their power to make that happen. In fact, they'd even volunteered, and my aunt had volunteered, they would go to the pharmacy and get them. But that was troubling my grandmother, and the fact she wanted the priest there to give last rites to my grandfather. And granted, the, the, the priest had come and would come and visit my grandfather periodically and give him anointing of the sick. Okay. And in the state he was in, he would have been in the state of grace considering his last confession, most likely. Okay. But that was bothering my grand grandmother. Unfortunately, there was another man dying in the hospital across town. Father went there first because based on the assessment, that guy was closer to death than my grandfather was. As it turned out, that guy did die first, but he was alone. So father stayed with him because he had no family. And he did not make it in time to give my grandfather last rites. But, you know, he, he made the right choice in the situation because my grandfather was surrounded by us, by family. When he passed, we didn't even really know it. Because when my dad walked in, I mean, he'd been having difficulty breathing. When my dad walked in, I don't know that he knew my dad, but he started making more noise like he did recognize my dad walked in and then he kind of quieted down and we started telling stories of his life particularly my my grandfather and grandmother loved to travel they when they retired they bought a motor home and they had been to all 48 states in the continental u.s and you know so we got to t grandmother got to tell you and i love to travel too so we got talking about places we had both been at different times and some of the this craziness that would go on in their adventures 
and we didn't realize till the nurse walked in and listened to his heart that he passed away while we were sharing and laughing about moments of his life okay he didn't receive last rites there was nobody there that could do it but he was surrounded by love and as soon as the priest got there and the priest was probably there within 10 minutes he went in and there are prayers that the priest can do along the lines of last rites anointing of the sick for those who have recently passed so just kind of sharing that personal experience with kind of the sacrament but like i said the priest definitely made the right decision he stayed with the person who had no one with him because sometimes like i said even though as family members we can't give last rites we can be there with them and pray with them and pray for them Okay, redemptive suffering. What's the difference between suffering and redemptive suffering? What makes suffering redemptive? Doing what? Right, asking Christ for help. Making it part of Christ's suffering. Turning it over you might hear the term turning it over to Christ, but at least uniting your suffering to Christ's suffering. Because through that, God can use that suffering for good. For good for you, for someone else, for the church. And it goes along with penance. And what are some of the things that we do when we kind of go into redemptive suffering, give it to Christ. How about suffering with minimal complaining? Okay, finally, let's talk about St. Francis real quick. St. Francis of Assisi. He was a rich and generous Italian nobleman. He was captured at a military battle and spent a year praying in a filthy dungeon, ill with fever. And that suffering helped change his life. After that, later on when he was out of the uh, dungeon, out of prison... He left all his riches behind and started the Franciscan order, and they're known for their service to the poor and the sick. So he used that time in suffering to later help others with their suffering. Now, who wants to do, who wants to find the, let me find it, the find it for the week. What is the Catholic meaning of the word lavable? And what is it used for? L-A-V-A-B-O. Lovable. Lovable. And I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly, I'm sure. You can use Google. I'll let, this is why I'll let you use your phones. <laughs> and and I, I will say, May, May definitely should know what this is. And, and I will tell you, I didn't either until I read the answer this morning. Once I did, it's like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. If Christopher was here, I would say he, would, he should know what it is. Well, I only say this because you do use it. Yes, it is, it is both. It is both the washing of the hands that Father does before saying the Eucharistic prayers, and it's the bowl used for the washing. Yeah, so it's actually the bowl. It's the bowl. It is, it's both the bowl, that's the name of the bowl, the official name of the bowl, but it's also the name for the ceremony, the, the action of him praying and washing his hands. Which is why I said May, because I know May and Christopher serve. 
I'm not sure if anybody else in here serves. If you do, I'm sorry, I just didn't know it. <laughs> I gotta say, uh, uh, or if you like to go on Saturday night, you can, so I don't have to sub in once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, that does count towards your service hours, because don't forget you do need service hours. Yeah, we haven't talked much about that. <laughs> yeah, we have time. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, a little plug, I gotta say. Because we, we haven't talked very much about your service hours, but we, we definitely at masses could use help. <laughs> hey, that's fine. We I guess uh, cause I can tell you I think you need to see Deacon Ken about being trained. Yeah, I gotta say <laughs> I don't, Saturday nights, it's, it's uh, very slim some days. Yeah, luckily we've had one family kind of step up and do the serving once my daughter finally stopped serving. <laughs> or she could no longer serve because she works on Saturday nights now. Okay. Any last questions on anointing of the sick? Any questions on that? Okay, let's do our closing prayer. I'm going to let you guys out a little early because we're I mean, not too early. Okay, In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oils in the name of the Lord. Lord, you suffered and you felt alone on the cross. You are very close to us when we suffer, especially when we feel completely alone. You always accept us just as we are, wounded by sadness and sin but you love us too much to leave us that way. Thank you for the powerful graces we receive through anointing and for teaching us to accept our sufferings willingly, knowing that they bring us closer to you and help us to become the authentic and heroically loving people that you call us to be. Amen. Okay.